The Cemetery, written by Barbara Joan Russell, also known as Ruth Ann Norton. Narrated by Craig Norton and Ruth Ann Norton. I dare you to spend the night in the cemetery, Clive Jenkins said with a sly grin. Joe Stanton gulped down the rest of his beer and threw it in the trash can in Clive's garage. He glanced at his group of friends. Two girls and one boy watched him closely. The boy and girl on the old tattered sofa in the corner were too busy making out to care about the conversation ensuing at the party. Clive's parents were out, so the friends decided to get together to raid Clive's dad's stash of beer he hid from the family. This was their last party as high school seniors. Joel grunted under his breath as he looked at Emily. He could think of many things he'd rather do than spend the night in a cemetery. If it had been anyone but Clive, he would have turned down the dare. Clive had been his best friend and rival since second grade. They were always trying to outdo each other, and this was a classic example of that fact. He didn't want to look like a wimp in front of Emily. Between him and Clive, he was better looking. After all, he had the blonde hair, blue-eyed, surfer guy appeal. Clive wasn't the least bit attractive with his bright red hair and millions of freckles covering his pale face and arms. But Clive did have the money. Clive had the car and the designer clothes. He also had access to the beer that made their party such a big hit. Joel reasoned that his good looks were not going to be enough to win Emily over. He would have to prove to her just how brave he was. Done, he finally agreed. Emily grimaced. The cemetery is creepy. I don't think it's a good idea. Joel smiled. Great. His plan was already working. I'll be fine, he assured her. When I make it through the night, how would you like to join me for a celebratory movie? She blushed prettily. Okay. Clive's mouth dropped. Joel smirked in his friend's direction. He thought you had me, didn't you? He was glad that Clive had witnessed the event. Clive regained his composure. Sure, that's a great idea. Tonight we can talk and get to know each other better, he told her. She nodded in agreement. Joel gritted his teeth, determined not to show his frustration. Sometimes he hated Clive. The other boy and girl suggested it wasn't safe to be in a cemetery at night, but Joel dismissed their protests. He had a point to prove now. When Emily realized that Clive would never do anything so risky, she would naturally have to pick him. Clive was a classic wimp. When tomorrow came... He would dare Clive to steal Mr. Lanning's final exam. Clive would refuse, and when he did, Emily would come to understand that Clive was just all talk. Ten minutes later, Clive and Emily dropped Joel off at the cemetery. We'll come back for you early tomorrow morning, Clive said. Emily glanced uneasily around the place. Maybe we should stay with him. No way! He's right, Emily, Joel said. I can handle this alone. She gave the place a glance that indicated her uncertainty, but didn't say anything. Tomorrow at seven, Clive told Joel before he drove off. Joel watched them go. He glanced at his watch. It was currently ten o'clock. His mother thought he was spending the night at Clive's, so she wouldn't miss him at home. There was a dent in one of the sides where hurricane-force winds had dug up a tree and threw it at a gate. Other than that, though, it was in good condition. The sky was clear. He viewed the stars in the quarter moon. There wasn't a lot of light, but it was enough for him to clearly see the rows of tombstones lining the paths. Now all he needed was a fog and spooky music to complete the effect. He studied his surroundings. Where would be a suitable place to sleep? He walked over to a patch of grass that hadn't been dug up yet. There was no sense in him sleeping over a dead body. He settled on the ground and rolled onto his back. The tree above him stood large in silence. There was no breeze tonight. He shifted uncomfortably. He should have brought a pillow and blankets. He chuckled under his breath. Just wait until Emily heard that he actually slept in the place. He rolled him to his left side. That was much better. He placed his arm under his head and closed his eyes. Thanks to his job delivering newspapers early on the weekday mornings, he was used to being exhausted by this time of night. He took the job because his mother was having a rough time making ends meet after his father died in the war. He pushed the memory aside. Clive was so lucky. His dad's secret sin might have been drinking too much, but at least he was alive. Clive's mother was the only one who made all the money. Sure, Clive rarely got to see her, but it was worth it, wasn't it? He frowned. He didn't want to think about Clive. He switched his mind to Emily. He imagined how eager she would be to listen to his tale about his night in the cemetery. 
he could picture her eyes looking at him with awe. He fell asleep easily. When he woke up, he was aware of the numbness in his arm and pain in his lower side. He rolled onto his back and put his numb arm by his side so it would regain feeling once more. He tried to go back to sleep, but every small rock poking into his back felt like knives trying to cut into him. The tingling in his arm got worse as the numbness wore off. He knew that the tingling would give away to pain soon. He shook his arm, willing the pain away. The crickets around him chirped. He wondered how many of them were out there. Probably hundreds. As they continued their song, the sound began to disturb him. With a shiver, he sat up and looked at his watch. It was three. He just had to wait another four hours and he was home free. He grunted his approval. He stood up and stretched. If he could tell Emily a couple of the names on some tombstones and then took her out there to prove it, she would know for sure that he'd spent the night there. He didn't want her to think he chickened out and went home just to return before Clive came at seven. He slowly walked towards the row of markers. Some of them had colorful flowers surrounding them. Others had been abandoned long ago. Weeds and grass grew around them, as if to suffocate them. He grimaced. He didn't relish the idea of being buried in the ground someday. He wondered why it hadn't occurred to him before the people, real people, were dead here. These people once lived. They had hopes and dreams, unfulfilled desires and joyful moments, just like he did. One day, his end would be the same. This was the way of all mankind. We are born so we can die. Emily was right. This place was creepy. Just as he grew bored of walking through the place, the crickets stopped chirping. His steps slowed. A slight breeze blew past him. A chill crawled up his spine. Something was different. Something was wrong. He looked down at his watch. 3.35. He groaned. Had it really only been half an hour since he'd woken up? This night was taking too long. The crickets picked up their chirping. He cleared his throat. He knew it wasn't right for them to stop and start back up in unison. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath. Steady, Joel. Take it easy. He opened his eyes. On the surface, things were as they had been when he arrived here, but something was wrong. He couldn't shake the feeling that lingered just on the edge of his mind. If he could just pull it out and examine it, then... Do I really want to do that? The question haunted him as he continued to walk. He should have brought something to occupy his mind. He had assumed he would sleep through the entire night. He thought about returning to the nice spot of grass and trying to go back to sleep, but he was too anxious to calm down. He reached for the phone in his pocket. No, I won't wimp out. I can't. Emily won't date a loser. Of course, had it not been for Clive's dare, he wouldn't be out here in the first place. If it wasn't for Clive, Emily would be mine already. He caught the slight movement of a shadow behind a tree. He froze in place, his eyes trained on the tree. The leaves rustled. Did the thing climb up into the tree? He considered checking it out, but decided against it. He backed away. He kept his eyes focused on the tree. He would go to the cemetery entrance and wait the rest of the night there. He tripped on one of the tree roots. He managed to recover his balance before he fell. He shook his head. He didn't remember the tree being right behind him. He glanced up at the sky. It was still a calm, clear night. The stars still shone brightly, and the moon was there like it had been before. He gulped the nervous lump in his throat. Wait. The moon was full now. He didn't remember that. I'm right. Something is wrong. He heard some breathing coming from the tree behind him. He had two choices. He could confront whatever it was, or he could run away. In the end, he chose to get away from the tree. If he could just make it to the entrance of the gate, he would be okay. But the entrance was no longer there. Rows and rows of tombstones surrounded him. Trees scattered throughout the graveyard. In every direction he looked, there was no end in sight to the tombstones. There was no way out. The crickets stopped again. The thing was watching him. He couldn't see it, but he could feel the weight of its stare burning into him. It was going to catch him. He frowned. How did he know that? Because it always catches you. He blinked in surprise. He had been here before. He had been here many times before. Did he ever escape? There must be an escape if he ended up in Clive's garage drinking beer. Though he didn't turn around, he could hear the thing creeping up behind him. This is it. This is how it ends. He swallowed and did his best to steady his nerves. No, it never ended. He was stuck in an endless loop. He always ended up back in Clive's garage on that night he accepted Clive's dare. Memories flooded through him like a tidal wave. 
He would run through the graveyard. His steps wouldn't be random. He wouldn't watch where he was going. One time he went left, another he went right. But no matter which way he ran, he would always end up at the same tombstone. The thing wanted him to end up there. Because it's his tombstone. The thing reached out and grabbed his shoulder. Jaw screamed and broke into a run. Cold sweat lined his forehead. The moon turned to the color of blood, leaving an eerie red glow over everything. His throat went dry. The thing ran behind him. It was always behind him. And no matter which direction he went, it never lost him. Why am I doing this? Why do I keep running when I know it won't work? He ran around a tree he hadn't run by before. The thing was still behind him. It was groaning his name. It dragged his name out, as if severing every letter. Despite the fact that Joe was breathing rapidly from the effort of running, the thing's breathing remained normal. It wasn't human. Then what could it be? It wasn't a monster. Monsters didn't exist. It wasn't an animal. No animal could pursue him like this. So then, what could it possibly be? You know. The accusing voice in his mind echoed as he ran blindly through the cemetery. He jumped over some and ran over others. He knew the thing expertly traced his steps. It could read his mind. I can't outrun this thing! He fell on the ground. The thing was gone. Where did it go? He clawed at the dirt in the ground. The grass barely had time to go in this spot. This grave was only a year old. He didn't want to look at the tombstone. I won't look this time. If I don't look, I won't have to face the truth. The truth about what? The truth about me. Silence hung in the air around him like a thick blanket. This was the calm before the storm. It was the same false sense of security he experienced every night. This was the moment when it seemed like the thing would finally leave him alone. The truth. Face the truth! For who? For his mother? For Emily? No. For yourself. He shook his head, willing the realization away. The past wouldn't leave him alone. It hovered over him, always suffocating him. He finally looked at the tombstone. He had to if the nightmare was to end. What he read made his blood freeze. Clive Jenkins. Murdered by Joel Stanton. The thing that chases me every night is him. Something moved beneath him. A hand reached up and grabbed his ankle. Clive, I didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. Joel screamed. His plea sounded hollow, even to him. Who are you kidding? You meant to do it. You hated him, remember? Clive's hand dragged him into his grave. He struggled to get away from Clive's grip, but he was powerless against it. Clive pulled his body to the ground. The dirt and rocks and bits of grass surrounded him. As he sank further into the grave, he kept thinking that he should ask someone for forgiveness. But who? Clive? No, Clive was already dead. It wouldn't do him any good to apologize to Clive now. Besides, he had tried that other nights when he had the same dream. There was one thing he hadn't tried. It was so simple, but the scariest option he had. What do I have to lose? He choked on the dirt as it filled his mouth. His head was covered in the stuff and everything went black. Joel woke up with a start. His body dripped with sweat. The nightmare that plagued him every night started shortly after he killed Clive. He had been careful to make it look like an accident, and his ploy had worked. No one suspected a thing. He wished he could forget it, but the guilt haunted him. He got out of the bed in his dorm room. The picture of his girlfriend, Emily, sat by his bed. She would have been Clive's girlfriend if he hadn't arranged that drowning accident. He walked to the bathroom sink and looked at himself in the morning light. He turned on the water and washed his face. One year ago today, he killed Clive. Only one year had passed, but it felt like fifty. He looked so old. He turned off the water. He couldn't take it anymore. He was going crazy with these dreams. Until he dealt with his sin, he would never find rest. He would confess to the police. Sure, his mother would be disappointed in him. Emily would break up with him. Clive's parents may or may not care. He wondered how much they even loved him. Looking back, he realized that Clive lived a very lonely life. He walked back to his bed and picked up the phone. It was time to do the right thing. It wasn't a perfect solution, he realized, but at least it was a start. He confessed his crime after the 911 operator picked up the line, and for the first time in a year, he began to feel at peace with himself. The End